I pray, God, that your spirit would just lay us bare this morning and that you would tear down walls of fakery. You would tear down facades, Lord, that you would cause each heart to be examined open and truly this morning. Be at work as your word does its laser-like sharpening, its cutting effect. And as you lay us bare, show us the refuge of Christ. Lead us to the one where we find all our security in and all our strength and all our comfort. Lead us to the one who provides all of our nourishment. But lay us bare first. In the power of your word, in Christ's name, amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to John chapter 1 and verse 44. As most of you know, Queen Elizabeth died a few weeks ago. And as I saw various reports about her death, about her life, I saw one report that showed her sense of humor. Perhaps you saw this one. The story was that she and one of her guards were enjoying a nice day in a fairly secluded park when two American hikers came upon them and struck up a conversation and the, the hikers had no idea who she was. And so it quickly became apparent that they didn't know who she was and so as the general conversation continued, they asked the older woman in their mind where she lived and she said that she lived in London but that she had a holiday home just over the way and they said how long have you been coming to this park and she said oh ever since I was a girl probably 80 years or so or so and they said oh well you must have met the queen at some point and she said no but Dick here referring to her bodyguard Dick meets her on a regular basis. And the, the American hikers turned the attention to him because he was the famous one in their minds. And they said, well, what's she like? And the guard says, well, she's a bit cantankerous, but she's okay. And they focused on the man, the one that they thought was famous. And they even asked to take a picture with him. And they said, here, to the older woman, do you mind taking a picture of us? <laughs> and they flipped places and took a picture with the older woman and they left the conversation not still not knowing who the woman was and the queen told her bodyguard she said I'd love to be a fly on the wall when they show their friends their pictures it's not every day that you have that kind of experience but maybe you've had an experience similar where you're in someone's presence and you have no idea their significance until it's spelled out for you Maybe it's millionaires you pass in an airport or war heroes that you pass just driving down the road. Professional athletes that you wouldn't know because you don't watch the sport. Maybe it's a CEO, a popular nonprofit leader, politicians, celebrities that you have no idea of but you're just breathing the same air they are. I once shared a flight and coach with the winner of American Idol and a lot of people had no idea who he was unless they watched American Idol. We see people every day not knowing their significance. Just seeing them alone is not enough. And this text we're looking at this morning is a text about seeing. It's about a man named Nathaniel seeing Jesus and about Jesus seeing Nathaniel. But whereas our seeing of someone is shallow and often just surface level, when Jesus sees someone, he sees them to the very heart, to the depths of their depths. He sees every significant point about them. He sees every detail. There's no shadow that remains when the eyes of Christ turns upon one. He sees it all. He knows it all. And this morning, we're going to see him see Nathaniel. So look with me in John chapter 1 and verse 44. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. If I were to summarize this sermon in one sentence, I would do so like this. This sermon is about what Jesus sees in you and what you should see in him. This sermon is about what Jesus sees in you and about what you should see in him. There are two points that rise to the surface of this narrative. Number one, Jesus sees the real you. Jesus sees the real you. This is evident in what transpires between the interaction of Nathanael and Jesus. Notice how this interaction builds. Verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now remember, I had in the a couple of weeks ago, I had to cut the sermon short. We were right in the middle of Jesus calling disciples to himself. Philip is one of the disciples that Jesus has called to himself. He finds Philip. He calls him to follow. And he does. And now John tells us about Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, which is also the home of Andrew and Peter. Now, why would John concern us with the geography of hometowns here? Why does that matter? Well, we're going to see as we progress through this text and get to Nathaniel. We're going to see geography matters a lot to Nathaniel. And so John is building us up for what's about to happen in a moment concerning the hometown of individuals. Now there are three locations of emphasis in this text. And we're going to go just on a brief road trip to these three locations. What should we know of Bethsaida as mentioned in verse 44? Bethsaida was a northern sea town around the Sea of Galilee. Andrew, Peter, and Philip are all from this town. It was a fishing town. So if you have the Sea of Galilee here, Bethsaida would have been at its northern shore. It shouldn't surprise us that many of the disciples come from this place, being a fishing town, as this was a trade that many of the disciples lived in. It's in Galilee, by the Sea of Galilee, on the northern shore, you have Bethsaida. The next location on our road trip is Cana. Now, You'll notice Cana is not list in, listed in this text, but Nathaniel is. So what's the connection between Nathaniel and Cana? Well, if you were to look up John chapter 21 verse 2, you'd see that Cana is Nathaniel's hometown. You see it described there as Nathaniel of Cana. And it's going to be Cana that actually Jesus goes to next to perform his first miracle that we'll get into next time in John chapter 2 where you have that famous miracle of the wedding of Cana where Jesus turns water into wine. This is Cana. It's Nathaniel's hometown. Now Cana was not on the Sea of Galilee. It was not as large as Bethsaida. It was more southwest. So if you have the Sea of Galilee here and you have Bethsaida on the northern shore, you have Cana a little bit southwest over to the side. It wasn't as big. It's still a respectable town. We'll see that it has luscious fig trees. It's got plenty of water source. We'll see next time at the wedding of Cana. This is Nathaniel's hometown and he's quite proud of it, we're going to see. But there's one more location that needs mentioning. Bethsaida, Cana, Nazareth. Nazareth was even further south than Cana. You have the Sea of Galilee, you have Bethsaida, you have Cana, and you have Nazareth, even further southwest. 
even further down. It's even, it's even smaller than Cana. It's not as respectable as we see Nathaniel kind of scoff at it. It was unique. It was a town that was close enough to Galilean trade routes so they could benefit from the commerce to some, to some effect. But it was just far enough away where they practiced a certain amount of independency that kind of gave off this aloofness, so to speak. They came across as cold, lowly, perhaps country folk who just kept to themselves, who only went up to the main hub of commerce when they had to, but otherwise they could do what they needed in their lower state of Nazareth. It was a lower population, maybe about 2,000 residents. So as John begins this section, it's, hopeful to, it's helpful to know those geographical dynamics. And we're going to see why in just a second. That they're at play, directly influencing what's done here. You have the northern sea towns of Bethsaida, Capernaum, that you'll see Jesus do many of his miracles in. Then you have a little further southwest, Cana. Then still further southwest, Nazareth. Bethsaida is bigger and bustling. Cana is pretty respectable. Nazareth is looked down upon. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone here, but to put this in context, it'd be like referencing Bethsaida as Greenville, Cana as Greer, and Nazareth as Reedville. You see the difference in population, difference in what's offered in commerce, size and distance, it would have been about the same. And so we see Philip of Bethsaida go to Nathaniel of Cana Verse 45, Philip found Nathanael. And what does he say? We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. We found him of whom Moses wrote about and the prophets. Now what's he talking about? This is the same thing that's referred to by the other disciples when they say, this is last time, remember Andrew goes to Peter and he says, we found the Messiah, we found the Christ. This is the promised king of Israel. They had waited on for years. He's going to come. He's going to save his people. This is the one that's been written about in all their religious writings. In the Pentateuch by Moses and Samuel in the historical writings. In all the prophets, they speak of this one to come. And Philip now tells Nathaniel, we have found the one that they've all been writing about. You can imagine Philip exclaiming to Nathaniel, you know the one that Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy 18 of this great prophet that's going to come behind him? You know the one that Micah wrote about? About the birth location of the Messiah and, and in Isaiah chapter 7 about the one being born of a virgin and Samuel writing about the Messiah being born and, and he's going to be an heir to King David? Nathaniel, you know about Psalm 45. It writes about the eternal throne that the Messiah is going to establish. And Hosea 11 that speaks about how he's going to be spending time in Egypt. Nathaniel, do you remember when Jeremiah 31 said that there's going to be hostility that surrounded his birth? And Malachi 3 said that there would be a forerunner to come before him. And Zechariah 9 said that he would be a king. And Zechariah 11 said that he'd come riding in on a donkey. And Isaiah 9 said that he'd bring light to Galilee. Nathaniel, we found him. Moses wrote about him. The prophets wrote about him. They all wrote about him. We've been waiting on him. He's here. Don't you see? It's Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel of Cana says, wait a minute, from where? Nazareth? Verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I grew up in a location where I had a fountain in address that was in Lawrence County, but I went to Woodruff Schools. <laughs> and it was really helpful when something bad happened in Woodruff. I'm not from Woodruff. I'm from Lawrence. Or something bad happened in Lawrence. I'm not from Lawrence. I'm from Fountain Inn. There's this little circle of protecting yourself from the disdain toward a certain region. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Thousands of years of prophecy. 
people over and over and over pointing to the anointed king of God coming. He came and, and Philip says, we've found him and Nathaniel is stuck on location. It's like if the second coming of Jesus happened today and he split the sky and he's there and you see him in all his glory and you say, oh, come on, why'd you have to come in the morning? I'm not a morning person. It'd be absurd. What's Nathaniel's problem? He's showing his prejudice here. He has a preconceived opinion about Nazareth and those associated with Nazareth that is dampening his attitude toward the Messiah. He's given judgment not founded on facts. He's assuming here, he's just judging a book by its cover. I mean, Nazareth was only about 10 miles south of Cana, maybe his entire life, he's experienced that small town rivalry. Burns, Dorman, Burns, Gaffney, Woodruff, Clinton, Hillcrest, Malden. But for them, it wasn't a lighthearted sports debate. It was, a lay, it was a way of life. And we stay away from those Nazarenes, those backwoods, down low, low, down, low down, uneducated, redneck, wilderness wanderers. We can do better than that. Come on, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, let's call this for what it is. This is not just how he's raised. It's not just small town rivalry. It's not just how things go. Nathaniel's acting in sin here. All throughout scripture, we see Jesus tearing down walls of negative prejudice actions. Jews versus Gentiles. Jews versus Samaritans. And Jesus just obliterates them. In Matthew 8, we see a Gentile's faith is what Jesus says, no one in Israel have I found faith is like this one. Think about how the Jews like that. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells a parable about a man lying on the road, dying. People pass him. Nobody's helping him. The Jew won't help him. The priest won't help him. The Levite won't help him. Who helps him? A Samaritan helps him. This is the conviction of Scripture. There's simply no place in the Christian life for negative prejudice to reside in the Christian's heart. Brothers and sisters, it's the beauty of the gospel that brings different people together under the banner of the Lordship of Jesus. This is what the beauty of the gospel shows us, that we're not all alike. And there's dangers on both sides here. There's dangers of, yes, being prejudiced against those who are different than you. And there's also a danger of just kind of trying to smooth our differences over as if they don't exist. No, God created us different. Male and female, different skin colors, different backgrounds. Not to hold it against each other and not to smooth them over, but to live within our differences under the unity of Jesus as Lord. If you're living with prejudiced motives and judgments in your heart this morning, I would call you to repent because it's not the way of the gospel. Notice Philip is not thrown off by Nathaniel's question. He simply and calmly replies, verse 46, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Come and see. Now notice this is the language Jesus used to draw his disciples in. Where are you staying? Come and see. When you're engaging with a, a skeptic, a family member, a friend, and they're hesitant about the gospel, a little uncertain about Jesus and a little uncertain about those Christians, a little uncertain about that church, at some point, the reasoning stops and it's helpful to say, come and see. Just come and see. It, my pastor's preaching through the life of Jesus right now. Would you come to church with me four weeks? Just give four weeks. Just come and see what happens. Would you read through the Gospel of John with me? Just, just see what happens. Come and see. So Nathaniel takes him at his word and he comes and sees. Look at verse 47. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, 
an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Just like all the others, Jesus takes the initiative. Just as he turned last time and confronted the two disciples following him, just as he sees Peter coming from a distance and changes his identity, just as he found Philip and effectually called him here again, Jesus makes the first move. He sees Nathanael coming from a distance and he says, Behold, same word John the Baptist used, Look, there's a true Israelite in whom there's no deceit. Now, what is Jesus saying? Clearly, Nathaniel has prejudices in his heart. What does he mean? There's no deceit found in him. How can Jesus say that? Well, Jesus is not saying that the man is faultless. He's not claiming that Nathaniel is perfectly righteous and there's not a deceitful bone in his body. Of course, he's not perfectly righteous. He's a sinner just like everyone else. Instead, Jesus is pointing out here the candor that marks Nathaniel's life. Nathaniel's not a fake. At least what characterizes him is that he speaks honestly what he thinks. He's not deceiving you with words. He's not tricking you behind your back. He's not, found, he's not fond of Nazareth and he doesn't hide it. He wears it on his sleeve. He's not deceiving you about his thoughts there. One commentator pointed out that that word deceit, there's no deceit in him, is the same word that's used to describe Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob was a man full of deceit. It's what he's known by. And unlike Nathaniel, Jacob always had a trick up his sleeve. But what it's saying here of Nathaniel is not that he's perfect, but that there is no Jacob in him. He speaks what he means, means what he says. Now, Nathaniel has never met Jesus, and Jesus just nails him first sight. <laughs> I prayed a minute ago that God, through his word, would expose us. Imagine standing before Jesus. He doesn't even say anything to you. You don't say anything to him. He just sees you, and he nails you from the sight. He just knows everything about you. Jesus has completely exposed him without even talking to him. Coming from a distance. Now there's an Israelite that shares his mind. And so he asked in verse 48, How do you know me? You see that? Jesus sees Nathaniel. He renders an accurate judgment of him. He gives an accurate account of Nathaniel's character and immediately Nathaniel connects it with, wow, this man knows me to the heart of hearts. I mean, Jesus has pinned the personality tale in the Israelite. He feels completely vulnerable to the knowledge of Jesus into his heart. How do you know me? Verse 48. Nathaniel said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus says, not only do I know you when I'm with you and when I see you, Nathaniel, I know you even when I'm not around you. He said, remember earlier in the day before Philip came and called you, you were sitting under that fig tree, the one right past Zebedee's place, the one right before you get to the wedding hall that they're decorating for Saturday. You know, the one that you've been sitting under for years. It's got that rock-shaped stool and you like to sit there and meditate. Nathaniel, I saw you there before Philip even came. All the way from Bethsaida, 20 miles away, I saw you. And this is enough for Nathaniel. He's heard what he needs to hear. He responds in verse 49. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus sees the real you. Brothers and sisters, do you see the invading, pervasive knowledge and sight of Jesus into you as a person? He sees the real you. 
Put yourself in Nathaniel's shoes. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a believer. Maybe you're kind of skeptical about these things. Maybe you're here and you're hearing about Jesus here. Put yourself in Nathaniel's shoes. You're walking up to Jesus. He lays his eyes on you. What would he say? Behold, a man, a woman, in whom, how would he describe you? I'm not talking about how your family and your friends describe you. I'm not talking about how you like to present yourself. How would Jesus describe you and your heart of hearts? The real you. As he looks into the deepest, darkest recesses of your soul. If he spotlighted that, that tucked away cave in your heart. If he journeyed through the thoughts of your mind, how would he describe you? Brothers and sisters, do you realize Jesus sees you as you are? All of it. He sees the insecurities, the paralyzing fear of man and what you worry about, what people think about you. Jesus sees it. Jesus sees the shame of what you just would rather keep hidden away for no one else to know. He sees the hurt of how no one understands, no one will listen. I can't talk about that one thing. We put a smile on, we come into the, the church building, everything looks great. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Jesus knows you're not. He sees the anxiety, the fear, the burdens that you keep stored away. He sees when you feel misunderstood and no one understands, no one believes you, everyone doubts you. Jesus sees. He sees the confusion, the doubts, your anger, your jealousy, your lust, your greed, your racism, your pride. Jesus sees it all. Nothing is hidden from his sight. And listen, if that is true, then that is scary. Isn't that scary? Why is that scary? Because if Jesus sees everything in my life, then he sees what a mess it is sometimes. If Jesus sees me not on Sunday morning, but if he sees me as I look at myself in the mirror on Monday morning, if he sees everything tucked away, then he knows what a wreck it is. That's scary. Worse, Jesus sees the darkest sins of my heart. That's scary. And this is where a lot of people get bogged down in religion. Please listen carefully. Everyone in the world feels morality, what's right and wrong. Everyone feels where they have fallen short. And everyone at some point thinks through the predicament, if God sees the real me, then I'm in trouble. And then all the world religions of the world go in all sorts of different ways trying to deal with that predicament. They try to cover it up. They try to excuse it. They try to escape from it. They try to take it away. If God sees me, then I'm in trouble. So what do I do about it? Atheism would rather deny it. It's not true. Just suppress it like a, a beach ball under the pool water until it eventually pops up. Agnosticism would rather just not think about it. No one really knows. No, it's not worth thinking about. Islam would cover it up with, well, do more, do better. Hinduism tries to recreate, well, do better in the new life that you come next time. Buddhism tries to escape to a more enlightened reality. Roman Catholicism blends faith with putting forth the best effort of yourself. Nominal Christianity excuses it. Well, it's not really that bad. Worldly living escapes. Take your mind off of it by indulging more in you. 
And all the religions of the world are trying to deal with this thought. If God sees me, then I'm in trouble. So what do I do? And biblical Christianity is the only religion where the predicament is solved, not by what you do, but by what God has done for you through Jesus. Friends, if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, maybe you're here with a family member, a friend, maybe you're just here checking things out, if you're not a Christian, I don't have to convince you of the guilt of your past. Now, you know what that feels like. Somewhere along the way, maybe even daily, the sins of your past just plague your mind. And at some point, you wonder if God is real and if he knows the real me, how will he ever accept me? Friends, the best news I have for you in the, in, in the entire world is that the Bible teaches what no other religion will teach you. The answer is not in what you do. The answer of why God will accept you is what God has done through Jesus for you. Let me speak to Christians in the room for a second. If you're a Christian today and you struggle with the inner toil of, and strife of your thoughts and your insecurities and your hurts that you feel no one could ever understand, brothers and sisters, be encouraged today. Jesus already knows them about you. Every single one of them in detail and he hasn't cast you off. No matter how messy your life, your inner life feels, God is working for you. As Romans 8, 26 says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Do you ever feel weak? The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Have you ever had the inner strife of your soul where it just feels so burdening, so, so hard that you don't know the words to say? You can't even say them in silence to God. And, and here Paul says the Spirit intercedes for us. As you're groaning, the Spirit is groaning with words too deep for words. And he searches hearts, knows what's the mind of... And, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for saints according to the will of God. Jesus sees your deepest hurt. He sees your deepest sin. Now look what Jesus says next. Verse 50. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Do you know what Jesus is saying here to Nathaniel? I mean, Nathaniel's stunned. I mean, he saw me under the fig tree. I was kicking doc rocks around 20 miles away. He saw me. That's amazing. He's the, Jesus says, don't get stuck there. Yes, it's amazing. I know the depths of your heart, but you're not meant to stop with that fact. It's meant to drive you to another meditation. So what does he want you to see? And this is the second point of the text. Number one, Jesus sees the real you. He doesn't want you to stop there. Because number two, Jesus would have you see him as the gate of heaven. Jesus would have you see him as the gate of heaven. Look at verse 51. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, when he says truly, truly, that is an expression that's meant to be the heightened statement of the conversation. It's, meant to, it's like saying, hey, listen up. Pay careful attention to this point. He's about to, he's about to say the most important line. Truly, truly, I say to you, and when Jesus says you there, it's plural. So, good country folk. Truly, truly, I say to y'all. Y'all will see heaven opened. Y'all will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. It's hugely significant. I'm not going to get into it now. I'll get into it later when it comes up. But for now, I want to deal with the depth and, of this phrase, you will see heaven open and angels ascending and descending. That is weird. I mean, that's weird. Y'all are going to see angels 
ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Well, to fully understand what Jesus is saying, we have to understand that it's a reference to something that happened in the Old Testament. This is what Ricky read earlier. All the way back in Genesis 28, Jacob is on his way to Laban, where he's going to eventually find a wife. But on the way, he stops for the night. He finds a nice hotel with a rock for a pillow. And he goes to sleep. And he's sleeping. Genesis 28, 12 tells us what he dreamed. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on earth. And the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So the picture is, Jacob is on earth. God is in heaven. There's a ladder in between them. It's like a highway to heaven. Like the Christian version of the ACDC song. It's a highway to heaven. And you go up and down it. What? Angels. It's what Jacob sees. Going up and down between God and man. And so Jacob responded like this in Genesis 28, 16. Jacob awoke and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. This is none other than the house of God. And this, listen, is the gate of heaven. He marked the place with a stone and called the place Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. In Jacob's mind, he's just found the entry point to heaven. I just climb this ladder and I'm there. The house of God, he found, quote, the gate of heaven. Now back to Jesus with Nathaniel. Truly, you will see heaven opened and angels ascending and descending, not on a ladder. <laughs> not on a ladder, but on me, the Son of Man. Nathaniel, this is what I see in you, but more importantly, this is what I want you to see in me. I'm the ladder between God and man. There is no ladder, physical ladder to climb to heaven, but there is a physical son of God who will take you there. I'm the ladder. And just as Jacob said, the name of the place will be Bethel, which is the house of God, in essence, I'm the new Bethel. I want you to see me as the gate of heaven. Now, what does a gate do? A gate has two purposes. One, a gate keeps things out. But a gate also serves to show where the entry point is. Right? I mean, Jesus used the same illustration in John 10 where he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The image is living vulnerable, all alone, burdened by sin, carrying the weight of the world on your back, and then you see a gate. And you walk through the gate, and there's just luscious green pastures and still waters. There's hope and Nourishment, and you're guarded by a shepherd and you're protected from the wolves and it's nourished and maintained. It's an image to show you go from hostility on the outside and you go through the gate and there's peace. And Jesus says, I'm the gate. So friends, this is where I'll close. What's the connection between the two? Jesus sees the real you and what should you see in him? It's a scary thought that Jesus would see into every cavern of your soul. It's a scary thought that Jesus will see every single sin, every single motive, every single judgment. It's a scary thought unless Jesus stands at the gate with you. See, the whole world feels just completely exposed. When we stand before God, we feel completely exposed. We are undressed before him and all that is before him is our unrighteousness. Jesus says, I'll stand there with you. And you won't be exposed. I'll clothe you in my righteousness. I'll give you what you need to enter the pasture of peace and joy with God. This is Jesus solving the predicament for us. 
Later we're going to see how he does this. He's going to say, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Meaning on a cross to die. And in Jesus' dying, he takes the penalty and the punishment and the wrath of God for all those deep, dark, secret caverns of sin in your life. And he takes them upon himself and he pays the record of your sin penalty. But then he comes to life on the third day showing that the penalty that he gave was taken and was sufficient. Have you turned away from your sin? Jesus calls you. You can enter the pasture with him at the gate. Will you turn away from your sin? You let go of the sin. You turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've got a messed up past. But I'm coming to you trusting that you'll pay for it all. That's what enters the gate with you. I'll trust you to pay for it all. For sinners and sufferers alike, Jesus stands as the gate of heaven. For sinners, he sees our sin and yet still in love goes to the cross. And on the cross, he doesn't just pay for those outward sins. He pays for the ones that are chained deep down in the anchor of our soul. And he says, be free from it. And for sufferers, he sees the depth of your discouragement and he reminds you the gate is there that leads to green pastures and still waters where he'll walk with you as no one else can understand and know, but he does because he walks with you and he bears the burdens of your soul. For sinners and sufferers alike, Jesus stands as the gate. Let's pray. Search our hearts and know us, O God. Bring to light what we would rather keep kept in the vault of our heart. But as you bring it to light, Lord, I pray as you're exposing dark caverns all over this room perhaps, Lord, I pray as they brought or to, uh, they're brought to the light that they will see the shepherding hand of Christ ready to meet them there, to pay for it, to free them from it, to release them from the bondage of it. Oh God, would you meet sinners all over this room right now, Lord, to give them freedom in Christ. Would you meet sufferers all over this room right now to give them encouragement in you so they would know you as the good shepherd. In Christ's name, amen. Now I'm gonna close just a little bit differently. Sorry to pull a curveball here, Mark. And just hang with me just a second. I'm gonna ask you to do something very different than what I normally do. I'm gonna ask you to close your Bibles. I'm gonna ask you to just close your eyes. I'm not doing anything like raise your hand or anything like that, don't worry. I wanna read a passage of scripture over you. And as you sit with your eyes closed, just meditate on these words that come from God, from Psalm 139. I'm going to read them, and then Mark and the team will then lead us in a, a final hymn. But let these words wash over you. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you are there. 
If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. <laughs>